All right, did you bring your Bibles with you? All right, go with me to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. It reads like this. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in, Jesus, and in Christ Jesus throughout generations, all generations forever and ever. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we once again thank you for your word and for your, for your eternal truths that guide us each day. Empower us with your spirit that we would uh, respond not only with our hearts, but with also uh, our, our words and our actions. So speak to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. As a Christian, one of the best ways to figure out what's on your heart or to find out what consumes you is to carefully study the content of your own prayers. Because in our prayers, we express what concerns us. Our desires, our anxieties, our troubles, our emotions, our passions, they all show up in our prayers. And we tend to pray for things that concern us and things that don't concern us much. We don't include them in our prayers. In this particular passage, we have another wonderful prayer and intercession. Paul is pleading with God. He's expressing his desire and he's so passionate about this stuff. He's praying for God's wonderful truths, things that he's been talking about prior to this prayer. He's asking for, for these spiritual realities to come to life in the heart and mind of the believer. Because he's fully aware that when that happens, it will result in us releasing the power of God, and that will result in us giving him the glory. So he begins interceding for the Spirit's power to take over the believer's life. It's a wonderful, wonderful prayer. And it ends with a verse that's pretty familiar to all of us, and I'm sure all of you have it memorized. Verse 20, which says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power that is at work, that is within us. Friends, the purpose of all our prayers is just that, isn't it? That we might experience, that we might come to a place where the power of God within us is doing things that exceed our imagination. That's the point of our prayers. And in order to experience the reality of this verse, where your life is so powerful that it brings glory and honor to God, you have to start where Paul starts. And so Paul, and you can see that he's going through a process, and he starts off by saying, for this reason I bow my knees. For this reason I bow my knees. For what reason, Paul? What are you so passionate about? What's on your mind? And he'll tell you, it's the mystery of the gospel. It's the mystery of the gospel. He appreciates the richness and the fullness and, and the inheritance that a believer has in Christ. He knows that, that God's resources are, are boundless and they're always available to his children. So he's passionately teaching and instructing to the church and the believers in Ephesus about who you are in Christ and how rich you are in, in him and how you should use those riches for his glory. And he's also fully aware that, he, that we did not earn the riches we have in Christ, but they are ours in God's mercy. We are rich because of God's will. You see, Paul understands God's purpose for mankind. He understands God's purpose uh, uh, through, through Christ, what he has done through, in and through Christ Jesus and what his spirit is continuing to do today. So he's writing from the prison to uh, the church in Ephesus, and he's saying, I don't want you to lose heart over me. 
No matter what I'm going through, yeah, I'm in jail, but I don't want you to worry about me. Rather than, be, than being weak and feeling disheartened, I'm going to pray for you so that you're going to be powerful people exceeding your own expectation of what God could accomplish through your lives. I don't want you stumbling around in weakness. I want you to live beyond your expectations. So I am going to bow my knees and plead before the Father on your behalf. Plead with the Creator God, the one who's in control over everything and every situation, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I am going to ask Him, our wonderful, wonderful God, to do something amazing in you. Do something wonderful in you. Something that will cause you to marvel at Him. Something that will cause you to give Him glory and honor. So the Apostle begins his intercession. And it's so wonderful to see this process unfold. This morning I want to give you three steps in his process that will get us to verse 20 and 21 where our lives will, will give him glory. So three steps. The first step is finding, your, finding spiritual strength. Can you say that with me? Finding spiritual strength. One more time. Finding spiritual strength. This is kind of like the ignition to get your engine started. Imagine having a nice car with its powerful engine with latest uh, technological features and gadgets. But what good is it to just own a car? It doesn't do any good to know where to drive it if you can't figure out how to turn it on, put it in, put it in uh, drive, and, and move it. Here you have the ignition, the key, the secret in the life of the believer that propels him from what he knows to what he is and what he can be in the power of God. From what he knows to what he is and what he can be in the power of God. And it starts with inner strength. I want you to look in your Bibles with me at verse 16. Let's go over it together. It says that according to the riches of his glory... He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being. Paul says, I'm interceding on your behalf so you would have a strong inner man. I'm pleading with God so you would have a strong inner man. Paul is pleading with God that according to His riches of His glory, He'll strengthen your inner man with Spirit's power. Let's talk about God's glory or the riches of His glory. God is glorious in all of His attributes. His power is infinite. His love is, is, is great. His mercy and, and grace are rich. His wisdom is unsearchable. He has the power to create anything from nothing. He has the power to deliver. He speaks and things happen. He's, his word sustains everything and he has power over death. And Paul knows this very well. And so he's passionately praying, Lord, according to those riches, according to your riches, bless your people with a strong inner man. Yeah. With a strong inner man. Wow, what if we start praying like that? What if we start praying like Paul and not always, Lord, uh, get rid of this problem or that problem, but praying, Lord, strengthen my inner man with your spirit's power. Yes. Strengthen my inner man with your spirit's power. And this is so important, isn't it? We all face different struggles and troubles and, and trials in life that, that can easily tear us apart. Things that make us question the plan of God. What am I going to do now, Lord? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to my son? Why is this happening to my daughter? Why is this happening in my family? Just why? 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 You see, some, sometimes things happen in our lives that, uh, things that, that steal our joy and peace and then weakens our inner man to the point where we lose trust, we lose hope. Doesn't matter that we're Christians because the truth of the matter is we often demonstrate an inability to cope with life and all of its problems. And life can be a very painful experience. The longer you live, the more painful it becomes because you accumulate a long history of pain and suffering. You accumulate a long history of disaster and disappointments. And when you have a weak inner man, you start to fear. You doubt. There's anxiety. There's distrust. You're frustrated. There's mental strain. There's emotional and spiritual imbalance. But as a Christian, if you are a Christian, you should know that the 
inner man is the eternal part. The real you, your soul. And Paul is saying, I want that thing strong. I want that thing strong. As long as, friends, as long as you live in this world, you have no choice but to pray what Paul prayed. Lord, strengthen my inner man with your spirit's power. How many of you are willing to pray that prayer this morning? Yeah. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 4.16, Paul says, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self, is, outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. In other words, he's saying the outside is getting worse, but the inside is getting better. But you know, we've got a problem. We've got a big, big, big problem. We live in a culture that is so concerned with the outer man because mainly because that's all they can work on. You don't go to a store looking for an inner man department, do you? You don't go looking for an inner beauty department, do you? It's all about the outer and our whole culture is just consumed with this. It has become a passion for some and for some it has reached the proportions of what we would define as bizarre. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And you see things and you wonder, what in the world is happening? See, our culture is so engrossed in preserving the outer man that it forgets that the outer man is, is wasting away. And the Bible reminds of, us of that. But the inner man, as the Bible says, is being renewed day by day. How many of you have heard of, of a Susan Boyle? Good number of you. Well. Now you definitely know who I'm talking about. <laughs> she was on Britain Got Talent, and I'm sure you saw her performance on, on TV, on YouTube, or whatever. But she, when, when she stepped onto the stage, uh, people laughed at her. They were wondering, what in the, in the world is this woman doing here? They, were, they made fun of her because of her outward exper uh, appearance. And it wasn't, it wasn't the glitz and glamour they had come to expect. They were rolling their eyes. They were wondering, what is she doing? What is she doing here? But when she began to sing, everyone recognized the beauty in her voice. And the rolling eyes changed to uh, looks of shock at the incredible talent this woman had to offer. And the resounding applause proved that she had what it took to be a star. She now has a net worth of over $30 million. Eh, no big deal. <laughs> you see, her talent was on the inside. Friends, God looks at us, when he looks at us, what we're all about by what's on the inside. That's what matters to him. Apostle Paul gives us a little experience that gives us an insight into how he was able to find spiritual strength. In 2 Timothy, he says, at my first defense, this is Apostle Paul saying, at my first defense, no one supported me. Everybody deserted me. May not be counted against them. There was I all alone. This is Apostle Paul saying. It sounds so sad. There, was I, there I was all alone. Nobody there to support me. But then he finds courage to say, but the Lord stood with me and he strengthened me. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me. What a tremendous testimony. That's exactly the kind of thing that our Lord does. Amen. He does it in times when we have, we have exhausted our spiritual resources, when we have exhausted our energy and time. But Paul reminds us, when we come to the point of our greatest weakness, in our weakness, his strength is perfected. Amen? Amen. In our weakness, church, his strength is perfected. I don't know what you're going through this afternoon, but I came to tell you that the Lord wants to bless you. He wants to anoint you. He wants to release the, release the power of the Spirit to strengthen your inner man. And my hope for you is that you would boldly declare that no matter what I am going through, and like the psalmist says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. You are going to comfort me. You are going to strengthen me. So in contrast to the outside perishing, the perishing outer man for the Christian, there is an increasing strength available to them, an increasing strength available to the inner man. And Paul says, I want you to know that power.
I want you to know that power. I want you to be strengthened with strength, empowered with power, the dunamis power through the spirit in the inner man. And friends, only, only the Holy Spirit can infuse such strength in the inner man. Only he can do that. And that's exactly why Paul says that you are to be filled with his spirit. That's exactly why he says that you are to walk in the Spirit. That's exactly why he says that, that you are to have the Word of God dwell in you richly. And when you yield yourself to the Spirit of God, you will find spiritual strength. You know, every Christian possesses Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit comes power. With power comes the potential to strengthen the inner man. But I've got a question for you this morning. Do you know how to turn it on? Do you know how to turn it on? Do you know how to activate that power? You know, Paul shows us how, and I'm so thankful for that. It's a matter of, of feeding that inner man with the richness of God's glory. Feeding the inner man with the truth of God. Which enables us to have a mind of the spirit. Which enables us to yield to the spirit. Walk in spirit and be filled with the spirit. So Apostle Paul says my first step in getting this ignition on. Is that all of this tremendous power that I've been talking about. That I've, that I've described to you. Will lead you in getting that inner man stronger by the spirit. As it feeds and yields on, on to the spirit who comes to us through the word of God. And friends only when you find spiritual strength. Only when the Spirit of God has made your inner man powerful, you're going to be able to say something like what Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's one thing to understand our richness. It's one thing to understand uh, our inheritance. It's one thing to understand our fullness in Him. It's something else to get the ignition on. So find your spiritual strength. That's the first step, finding your spiritual strength. The second step is making Christ dwell in your hearts through faith. Can you repeat that? Making Christ dwell in your hearts through faith. One more time. Making Christ dwell in your hearts through faith. A strong inner man is the result of Christ dwelling in your heart by faith. Christ at home. That's what verse 17 says. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love. You may be wondering, how can I have a strong inner man if Christ didn't dwell in my heart by faith? That's a good question, but the apostle is not talking about salvation here. It's not a question of whether Christ is in your life. It's a question of whether he's comfortable. It's a question of whether he's comfortable in your heart. See, there's a difference between being in a house and being at home. You can be dwelling in a lot of places and not be at home there. What the apostle is saying here is that as Christians, we should yield ourselves to the work and the power of the Holy Spirit to create a strong inner man so that, so that, Christ, this is the prerequisite, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. And that will result in us being rooted and grounded in love. The question I have for you this, mor this morning is, is Christ comfortable in your heart? Is he at home there? Friends, when Christ is, is settled down in your life and he's able to infuse his love into every corner, into every situation, then you're going to perceive the breadth and length and height and depth and know and experience his love which is according to the Bible is incomprehensible. Witness Lee, a Chinese preacher who ministered with Watchman Nee in the early 1900s to mid-1900s mid said this about, about Christ, uh, indwelling of Christ and it's so beautiful. Listen to this. He said, the more Christ spreads within us the more he settles down in us and makes his home in us, occupying every part of our inner being, possessing all these parts and saturating them with himself. 
Friends, that's a result of a deeper work of Christ living inside of you. Him being comfortable in your heart. That is the indwelling of Christ, as it says in some translation. That's what Paul is talking about. When we were saved, Christ came into our being. He came into our, our, our spirit. Now he wants to spread into all the parts of our heart so that he can make his home there, occupying every part of our inner being. If we don't allow... If we don't allow Christ to constantly make his home in our heart and to saturate us with himself, then we will live according to our inclinations and desires. And when you live in this world and you allow yourselves to live according to what you feel like, you know that's dangerous territory. That is going to mess you up. Allow Christ to dwell in your hearts. Let him make his home there. Let him be comfortable in your heart. When he settles down and is at home in your life, that's going to lead you to what Paul says in verse 17 through first part of verse 19. I want to read it for you. He says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. When Christ settles down and is at home in your life, he transforms you into love. What does he mean when he says being rooted and grounded in love? He means love is not peripheral. Love is not on, on, on the circumference. Love is not a now and then uh, type of thing where you can just fake it. But it is the essential root and ground of all that you are. When Christ takes over your life, when he resides in your heart, when he makes his home there, the characteristic will be love. You'll understand his love. And you'll, when, when you sing songs like how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, you'll know what that's all about. Yes. The result of that kind of an understanding will lead you to love the way he loved. His love will flow through you. And friends, this kind of an understanding comes by faith. It comes by faith, not by works, but by practicing his presence in our life. Amen? By practicing his presence, rooted and grounded in love. By this, Jesus said, will all men know that you're my disciples when you have love for one another. When Jesus Christ can, when he can settle down at, and be at home in your life, he'll fill your life at every point with love to the point where you are rooted and grounded. And that's what Paul is saying here. When Christ settles down and is at home in your life, your, love, your, your life will be dominated by his love, which is incomprehensible apart from experiencing it. This is the kind of stuff that excites Paul. This is what he's so passionate about because he knows this is the truth. And he wants us to be strengthened in his love, rooted and grounded in it. Now love, I love how Paul uses these two words. He joins these two metaphors to express his longing for us to be strengthened in God's love. The word rooted is botanical, and the word grounded has an architectural connotation, both of which emphasize depth. He wants us to have deep roots and firm foundations, like a well-rooted tree, like a well-built house. And love is to be that soil in which your life is rooted. Love is to be that soil or that foundation on which your life is built. It's only then. <coughs> Only then, when Christ has settled down in your life and he's spreading his love into every corner, that you are going to comprehend the breadth and length and the height and the depth of his love. Amen? You know, people often say that the greatest thing in the world is to love and to feel loved. The greatest emotion in the world is to feel love. It's the most wonderful feeling there is. But to feel the love of our Father... Boy, that's something else. That's a wonderful feeling, isn't it? It is what a Christian experiences, a Christian who is totally, completely, fully committed and filled with the love of Christ. 
Paul prays that, that we'll be able to comprehend, we'll have the power to comprehend the love of Christ in its full dimension, its breadth and length and height and depth. How broad is his love? Broad enough to encompass all mankind. Jews and Gentiles, all of us here in this room. How long is his love? Long enough to last for eternity, forever and ever. How deep is his love? Deep enough to reach the most degraded sinner. And how high? High enough to exalt us back to heaven. Yeah. Amen. Come on, that's shouting stuff right there. Give him praise. Give him praise. Amen. And I love what Paul says in Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present or the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is Paul's longing, friends. This is his plea. This is what he's interceding for. First, we would find inner strength. We would find spiritual strength. Second, we would have Christ dwell in our hearts through faith, which leads us to being rooted and grounded in love. And that leads me to my th the third step, which is filling up to God's fullness. Can you say that with me? Filling up to God's fullness. One more time. Filling up to God's fullness. When all of what we talked about is true, we come to the next result in verse 19, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. All the fullness of God. Man, just trying to grasp that thought is just mind-boggling. God sees us sort of like a vacuum. When nature sees vacuum, it, it fills it up. When God sees any vacuum, he wishes to rush in with his presence. He's, he, he wishes to rush in with his love and power. Friends, when we are what we ought to be, we will be filled with all of the fullness of God. And that's what Paul is praying for, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. All there is. Now what does that mean? What does it mean to be filled with all the fullness of God? That simply means that we'll be like him. We'll be like him. Jesus was full of grace and truth. The Bible says out of his fullness we have all we've received grace upon grace. It's simply the idea that we've become like Christ, like God. You follow this process where you're strong in the inner man. Christ is settled down, makes his home, and he's comfortable. And he's filling your life with this incomprehensible and overwhelming love that you're going to find yourself like God. That is to say, filled with his attributes. You're going to have the love of God and the peace of Christ. You're going to know all that. You're going to even have the knowledge of God and the wisdom of God to whatever degree possible. Now listen, when it says you are filled up with the fullness of God, it doesn't mean you become God. It simply means that the essence of who God is in his glory is going to fill your life. If I go down to an ocean, I take a little cup and, and scoop up some of the ocean, it wouldn't be proper for me to say that the entire ocean is in my cup because there's so much more. It's, it is vast and vastly beyond my cup. All of the ocean is not in my cup, but all that the ocean is, is in my cup. Amen? All of God is, is not in me, but what God is by virtue of his nature is in me, and therefore I become like him. Amen. Amen. Filling up to God's fullness. Filling up to God's fullness. Friends, that's what we yearn for. That's what we're chasing after. That's what we so desperately need. Wouldn't it be incredible to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God? And God is showing us the way through Paul, through his prayer and intercession. First, you pray for spiritual strength. 
Ask God to send his spirit to, to empower you, to make your inner man strong. Second, you, make, you have Christ dwell in your heart by faith, allowing him to be comfortable in your heart, which will result in you being rooted and grounded in love. And then you are on your way to be filled with the fullness of God. See, if you follow this, this sequence, you can be filled with all the fullness of God. Now think about that for a second. Being filled with the eternal almighty God, the creator God, the sustainer God, the God of the universe, the God who fills it all wants to fill me. The God who fills it all wants to fill you. Isn't that incredible? There's no way to measure it. Paul talks about this over and over over in Ephesians. In, in Ephesians 1.23, he says, The body, the church, is the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. In chapter 3 that we just covered, Paul says that you be filled with the fullness of God. In chapter 4.10, he says that he might fill all things. And in chapter 4.13, he says, Until we all reach unity in faith and in knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of God. You see, God doesn't settle for anything other than total fullness. What kind of God wants us, wants to fill us with himself? What kind of God do we serve, friends? Isn't he amazing? Isn't he amazing? Now we're getting down to why we can be powerful. If I'm filled with the fullness of God, then God is going to move powerfully through me. And that takes us to verse 20 and 21. Just dissect that verse, verse 21. Look at, look at it with me in your Bibles. It's just amazing. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? I'm going to ask the worship team to come and help me close here. Friends, sometimes we live, sometimes most of us live in the shallows, don't we? Powerful lives are built on these principles. They're not built on clever ideas. You can build an, an, an empire on clever ideas. You can start a business with your clever ideas, but not spiritual power. The path to spiritual power goes right through Ephesians. It goes right through this verse. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that is at work in us. Amen. You know, Paul walked that path. And that's why to the Colossians, he said that God works mightily in me. He was a living illustration of this verse. The man did things beyond what he could ever ask, think, or imagine. Tremendous power is available to every issue of life. How many of you believe that? That's why God did not give us a spirit of fear, but what? Spirit of power. Aren't you thankful for that? Who's thankful for that? Amen. Amen. You ask, why would the creator God, the sustainer of this universe, this amazing, powerful God, why would he want to make us powerful? The answer is in verse 21. And it says, unto him, be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's why. That's why. In order that he might display his glory through us. In order that he might display his glory through his church. That's the reason for everything. You see, as Christians, we're not tied up to our cleverness. We're not tied up to our style. We are connected to our which is connected to this pattern of spiritual resource. So my prayer for you, my prayer is that you will be to the glory of God, that you will bring him praise and glory and honor, and that you will conclude that he is indeed a powerful, mighty, and a saving God. Amen. Can you stand?